Witness for the Prosecution. The Witness for the Prosecution was first published in the USA in Flynn's Weekly, 31st of January, 1925. Mr. Mayhern adjusted his pince-nez and cleared his throat with a little dry-as-dust cough that was wholly typical of him. Then he looked again at the man opposite him, the man charged with willful murder. Mr. Mayhew was a small man, precise in manner, neatly, not to say foppishly, dressed, with a pair of very shrewd and piercing grey eyes. By no means a fool, Indeed, as a solicitor, Mr. Mayhern's reputation stood very high. His voice, when he spoke to his client, was dry, but not unsympathetic. I must impress upon you again that you are in very grave danger, and that the utmost frankness is necessary. Leonard Vole, who had been staring in a dazed fashion at the blank wall in front of him, transferred his glance to the solicitor. I know you keep telling me so, but I can't seem to realise yet that I'm charged with murder. Murder! And such a dastardly crime, too! Mr. Mayhern was practical, not emotional. He coughed again, took off his pince-nez, polished them carefully, and replaced them on his nose. Yes, yes, yes. Now, my dear Mr. Vole, we're going to make a determined effort to get you off, and we shall succeed, we shall succeed. But I must have all the facts. I must know just how damning the case against you is likely to be. Then we can fix upon the best line of defence. Still the young man looked at him in the same dazed, hopeless fashion. To Mr. Mayhern the case had seemed black enough, and the guilt of the prisoner assured. Now, for the first time, he felt a doubt. You think I'm guilty, but by God I swear I'm not. It looks pretty black against me, I know that. I'm like a man caught in a net. The meshes of it are all around me, entangling me whichever way I turn. But I didn't do it, Mr. Mayhern. I didn't do it. In such a position, a man was bound to protest his innocence. Mr. Mayhern knew that. Yet in spite of himself, he was impressed. It might be, after all, that Leonard Vole was innocent. You are right, Mr. Vole. The case does look very black against you. Nevertheless, I accept your assurance. Now let us get to the facts. I want you to tell me in your own words exactly how you came to make the acquaintance of Miss Emily French. It was one day in Oxford Street. I saw an elderly lady crossing the road. She was carrying a lot of parcels. In the middle of the street she dropped them, tried to recover them, found a bus was almost on top of her, and just managed to reach the curb safely, dazed and bewildered by people having shouted at her. I recovered the parcels, I wiped the mud off them as best I could, and I retied the string of one and returned them to her. There is no question of your having saved her life. Oh, God, dear me, no! All I did was to perform a common act of courtesy. She was extremely grateful thanked me warmly and said something about my manners not being like that of most of the younger generation. I can't remember the exact words. Then I lifted my hat and went on. I never expected to see her again. But life is full of coincidences. That very evening I came across her at a party at a friend's house. She recognised me at once, asked that I should be introduced to her. I then found out that she was a Miss Emily French and that she lived at Cricklewood. I talked to her for some time. She was, I imagine, an old lady who took sudden violent fancies to people. She took one to me on the strength of a perfectly simple action which anyone might have performed. On leaving, she shook me warmly by the hand and asked me to come and see her. I replied, of course, that I should be very pleased to do so. And she then urged me to name a day. I did not want to particularly go, but it would have been churlish to refuse. So I fixed on the following Saturday. 
After she'd gone, I learned something about her from my friends. That she was rich, eccentric, lived alone with one maid, and owned no less than eight cats. I see. The question of her being well off came up as early as that. If you mean that I inquired... No, no, no. I have to look at the case as it will be presented by the other side. An ordinary observer would not have supposed Miss French to be a lady of means. She lived poorly, almost humbly. Unless you had been told the contrary, you would in all probability have considered her to be in poor circumstances. At any rate, to begin with. Who was it exactly who told you that she was well off? My friend George Harvey, at whose house the party took place. Is he likely to remember having done so? I really don't know. Of course, it's some time ago now. Quite so, Mr. Vaughan. You see, the first aim of a prosecution will be to establish that you were in low water financially. And that is true, is it not? Yes. I'd been having a run of infernal bad luck just then. Quite so. But being, as I say, in low water financially, you met this rich old lady and cultivated her acquaintance assiduously. Now, if we are in a position to say that you had no idea she was well off and that you visited her out of pure kindness of heart, which is the case, I dare say, I am not disputing the point. I am looking at it from the outside point of view. A great deal depends upon the memory of Mr. Harvey. Is he likely to remember that conversation, or is he not? Could he be confused by counsel into believing that it took place later? Leonard Vole reflected for some minutes. Then he said steadily enough, but with a rather paler face, I do not think that line would be successful, Mr. Mayhew. Several of those present heard his remark, and one or two of them chafed me about my conquest of a rich old lady. The solicitor endeavoured to hide his disappointment with a wave of the hand. Unfortunate. But I congratulate you upon your plain speaking, Mr. Vole. It is to you I look to guide me. Your judgment is quite right. To persist in the line I spoke of would have been disastrous. We must leave that point. You made the acquaintance of Miss French. You called upon her. The acquaintance ship progressed. We want a clear reason for all this. Why did you, a young man of thirty-three, good-looking, fond of sport, popular with your friends, devote so much time to an elderly woman with whom you could hardly have anything in common? I can't tell you. I really can't tell you. After the first visit, she pressed me to come again. Spoke of being lonely and unhappy. She made it difficult for me to refuse. She showed so plainly her fondness and affection for me. But I was placed in an awkward position. You see, Mr. Mahon, I've got a weak nature. I drift. I'm one of those people who can't say no. And believe me or not, as you like, after the third or fourth visit I paid her, I found myself getting genuinely fond of the old thing. My mother died when I was young. An aunt brought me up, and she too died before I was fifteen. If I told you I genuinely enjoyed being mothered and pampered, I dare say you'd only laugh. But Mr. Mayhern did not laugh. Instead, he took off his pince-nez again and polished from always a sign with him that he was thinking deeply. I accept your explanation, Mr. Vole. I believe it to be psychologically probable. Whether a jury would take that view is another matter. Please continue your narrative. When was it that Miss French first asked you to look into her business affairs? Well, that was after my third or fourth visit to her. She understood very little of money matters. She was worried about some investments. Be careful, Mr. Vole. The maid, Janet Mackenzie, declares that her mistress was a good woman of business and transacted all her own affairs. And this is borne out by the testimony of her bankers. I can't help that. That's what she said to me. Mr. Mahon looked at him for a moment or two in silence. Though he had no intention of saying so, his belief in Leonard Vole's innocence was at that moment strengthened. He knew something of the mentality of elderly ladies. He saw Miss French infatuated with a good-looking young man, hunting about for pretexts that should bring him to the house. What more likely than that she should plead ignorance of business and beg him to help her with her money affairs? She was enough of a woman of the world to realise that any man is slightly flattered by such an admission of his superiority. 
Leonard Vole had been flattered. Perhaps, too, she had not been averse to letting this young man know that she was wealthy. Emily French had been a strong-willed old woman, willing to pay her price for what she wanted. All this passed rapidly through Mr. Mayhern's mind, but he gave no indication of it, and asked instead a further question. And you did handle her affairs for her, at her request? I did. Mr. Vole, I am going to ask you a very serious question, and one to which it is vital I have a truthful answer. You were in low water financially. You had the handling of an old lady's affairs, an old lady who, according to her own statement, knew little or nothing of business. Did you at any time or in any manner convert to your own use the securities which you handled? Did you engage in any transaction for your own pecuniary advantage which will not bear the light of day? Wait a minute before you answer. There are two courses open to us. Either we can make a feature of your probity and honesty in conducting her affairs, while pointing out how unlikely it is that you would commit murder to obtain money which you might have obtained by such infinitely easier means. But if, on the other hand, there is anything in your dealings which the prosecution will get hold of, if, to put it baldly, it can be proved that you swindled the old lady in any way, we must take the line that you had no motive for the murder, since she was already a profitable source of income to you. You perceive the distinction? Now, I beg of you, take your time before you reply. But Leonard Vole took no time at all. My dealings with Miss French's affairs are all perfectly fair and above board. I acted for her interest for the very best of my ability, as anyone will find who looks into the matter. Thank you. You relieve my mind very much. I pay you the compliment of believing that you are far too clever to lie to me over such an important matter. Surely the strongest point in my favour is the lack of motive. Granted I cultivated the acquaintanceship of a rich old lady in the hope of getting money out of her, that I gather is the substance of what you've been saying, but surely her death frustrates all my hopes. The solicitor looked at him steadily. Then, very deliberately, he repeated his unconscious trick with the pince -nez. It was not until they were firmly replaced on his nose that he spoke. You are not aware, Mr. Vole. Miss French left a will under which you are the principal beneficiary. What? My God! What are you saying? She left her money to me? Mr. Mayher nodded slowly. Vole put his head in his hand. You pretend to know nothing of this will? Pretend? There's no pretense about it. I knew nothing about it. What would you say if I told you that the maid, Janet Mackenzie, swears that you did know, that her mistress told her distinctly that she'd consulted you in the matter, and told you of her intentions? What would I say? That she's lying! No. No, I go too fast. Janet's an elderly woman. She, she was a faithful watchdog to her mistress, and she didn't like me. She was jealous and suspicious. I would say Miss French confided her intentions to Janet, and that Janet either mistook something she said, or, or else was convinced in her own mind that I'd persuaded the old lady into doing it. I dare say she believes herself now that Miss French actually told her so. You don't think she dislikes you enough to lie deliberately about the matter? No, indeed. Why should she? I don't know. But she's very bitter against you. Oh, I'm beginning to see. Oh, it's frightful. I made up to her, that's what they'll say. I got her to make a will, leaving her money to me. And then I go there that night, and there's nobody in the house. I find her the next day. Oh, my God, it's awful! You are wrong about there being nobody in the house. Janet, as you remember, was to go out for the evening. She went, but about half-past nine she returned to fetch the pattern of a blouse sleeve which she had promised to a friend. She let herself in by the back door, went upstairs and fetched it, and went out again. She heard voices in the sitting-room, though she could not distinguish what they said. But she will swear that one of them was Miss French's, and one was a man's. At half-past nine? But then I'm saved! I'm saved! 
What do you mean, saved? Oh, but by half past nine, I was at home again. My wife can prove that. I left Miss French about five minutes to nine. I arrived home about twenty past. My wife was waiting for me. Oh, thank God, thank God. Oh, God bless Janet Mackenzie's sleeve pattern. <laughs> In his exuberance, he hardly noticed that the grave expression of a solicitor's face had not altered. But the latter's words brought him down to earth with a bump. Who then, in your opinion, murdered Miss French? Why, a burglar, of course. That was thought at first. The window was forced, you remember. She was killed with a heavy blow from a crowbar, and the crowbar was found lying on the floor beside the body. Several articles were missing. But for Janet's absurd suspicions and dislike of me, the police would never have swerved from that, from that right track. Oh, that will hardly do, Mr. Bowl. The things that were missing were mere trifles of no value, taken as a blind, and the marks on the window were not at all conclusive. Besides, think for yourself. You say you were no longer in the house by half-past nine. Who then was the man Janet heard talking to Miss French in the sitting-room? She would hardly have been having an amicable conversation with a burglar. No. No. He looked discouraged. But, but anyway... It still lets me out. I mean, I've got an alibi. You must see Romain and my wife at once. Certainly. I should already have seen Mrs. Vole, but for her being absent when you were arrested. I wired to Scotland at once, and I understand she arrives back tonight. I am going to call upon her immediately I leave here. Yes, yes, Romain will tell you. My God, my God, it's a lucky chance, that... "'Excuse me, Mr. Vole, you are very fond of your wife?' "'Of course.' "'And she of you?' "'Remains devoted to me. She'd do anything in the world for me.' The solicitor's heart sank a little lower. The testimony of a devoted wife, would it gain credence? "'Was there anyone else who saw your return at nine-twenty? A maid, for instance. We have no maid. Did you meet anyone in the street on the way back?' Nobody I knew. I rode part of the way in a bus, the conductor might remember. There is no one, then, who can confirm your wife's testimony. No. But it isn't necessary, surely. I dare say not. I dare say not. Now there is just one more thing. Did Miss French know that you were a married man? Yes. Yet you never took your wife to see her. Why was that? Oh, uh, well, I, I don't know. Are you aware that Janet Mackenzie says her mistress believed you to be single and contemplated marrying you in the future? <laughs> what? That's absurd. There was a forty-year difference in age between us. It has been done. The fact remains your wife never met Miss French. No. You will permit me to say that I hardly understand your attitude in the matter. All right. I'll make a clean breast of it. I was hard up, as you know. I hoped Miss French might lend me some money. She was fond of me, but she wasn't at all interested in the struggles of a young couple. Early on I found she'd taken it for granted that my wife and I didn't get on. We're living apart. Mr. Mahern, I wanted the money, for Romaine's sake. So I said nothing. I allowed the old lady to think what she chose. She spoke of my being an adopted son for her. There was never any question of marriage. That must be Janet's imagination. And that is all? Yes, that's all. Was there just a shade of hesitation in the words? The lawyer fancied so. He rose and held out his hand. Goodbye, Mr. Vole. He looked into the haggard young face and spoke with an unusual impulse. I believe in your innocence, in spite of a multitude of facts arrayed against you. I hope to prove it and vindicate you completely. Thank you. You'll find the alibi is all right. Again, he hardly noticed that the other did not respond. The whole thing hinges a good deal on the testimony of Janet Mackenzie. She hates you. That much is clear. She can hardly hate me. The solicitor shook his head as he went out. Now for Mrs. Vole, he said to himself. He was seriously disturbed by the way the thing was shaping. The Voles lived in a small, shabby house near Paddington Green. It was to this house that Mr. Mayhern went. 
In answer to his ring, a big slatternly woman, obviously a charwoman, answered the door. Mrs. Vole, has she returned yet? If you will take my card to her. The woman looked at him doubtfully, closed the door in his face, and left him on the step. In a few minutes, however, she returned with a slightly altered manner. Come inside, please. She ushered him towards a tiny drawing room. Mr. Mayhern, examining a drawing on the wall, stared up suddenly to face a tall, pale woman who had entered so quietly that he had not heard her. Mr. Mayhern, you are my husband's solicitor, are you not? You have come from him? Will you please sit down? Until she spoke, he had not realised that she was not English. Now, observing her more closely, he noticed the high cheekbones, the dense blue-black of her hair, and an occasional very slight movement of the hands that was distinctly foreign. A strange woman, very quiet, so quiet as to make one uneasy. From the very first, Mr. Mayhern was conscious that he was up against something that he did not understand. Now, oh, my dear Mrs. Vole, you must not give way. He stopped. It was so very obvious that Romaine Vole had not the slightest intention of giving way. She was perfectly calm and composed. Will you please tell me all about it? I must know everything. Do not think to spare me. I want to know the worst. I want to know the worst. Uh, yes. Mr. Mayhern went over his interview with Leonard Vole. She listened attentively, nodding her head now and then. I see. He wants me to say that he came in at twenty minutes past nine that night. He did come in at that time. That is not the point. Will my saying so acquit him? Will they believe me? Mr. Mayhern was taken aback. She had gone so quickly to the core of the matter. That is what I want to know. Will it be enough? Is there anyone else who can support my evidence? So far there is no one else. I see. She sat for a moment, perfectly still. A little smile played over her lips. The lawyer's feeling of alarm grew stronger and stronger. Mrs. Vole, I know what you must feel, do you? I wonder. In the circumstances, in the circumstances. I intend to play a lone hand. He looked at her in dismay. But, my dear Mrs. Vole, you are overwrought. Being so devoted to your husband... I beg your pardon. Uh, I be, uh, being so devoted to your husband... <laughs> Did he tell you I was devoted to him? Mm, yes, I can see he did. How stupid men are. Stu stupid, stupid. She rose suddenly to her feet. All the tense emotion that the lawyer had been conscious of in the atmosphere was now concentrated in her tone. I hate him, I tell you. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. I would like to see him hanged by the neck till he is dead. The lawyer recoiled before her, and the smouldering passion in her eyes. Perhaps I shall see it. Supposing I tell you that he did not come in that night at twenty past nine, but at twenty past ten. You say that he tells you he knew nothing about the money coming to him. Supposing I tell you he knew all about it, and counted on it, and committed murder to get it. Supposing I tell you that he admitted to me that night when he came in of what he had done, that there was blood on his overcoat, what then? Supposing that I stand up in court and I say all these things. Her eyes seemed to challenge him. With an effort he concealed his growing dismay and endeavoured to speak in a rational tone. You cannot be asked to give evidence against your own husband. He is not my husband. The words came out so quickly he fancied he'd misunderstood her. I beg your pardon, I... He is not my husband. I was an actress in Vienna. My husband is alive, but in a madhouse, so we could not marry. I'm glad now. I would like you to tell me one thing. Why are you so bitter against Leonard Vole? Yes, you would like to know. But I shall not tell you. I will keep my secret. 
Mr. Mayhern gave his dry little cough and rose. There seems no point in prolonging this interview. You will hear from me again after I have communicated with my client. She came closer to him, looking into his eyes with her own wonderful dark ones. Tell me, did you believe, honestly, that he was innocent when you came here today? I did. You poor little man. <laughs> and I believe so still. Good evening, madam. He went out of the room, taking with him the memory of her startled face. This is going to be the devil of a business. Extraordinarily. The whole thing, an extraordinary woman, a very dangerous woman. Oh, women are the devil when they get their knife into you. What is to be done? That wretched young man hasn't a leg to stand upon now. Of course, possibly he did commit the crime. No, no. There's almost too much evidence against him. I don't believe this woman. She was trumping up the whole story. But she'll never bring it into court. He wished he felt more conviction on that point. The police court proceedings were brief and dramatic. The principal witnesses for the prosecution were Janet Mackenzie, maid to the dead woman, and Romaine Helga, Austrian subject, the mistress of the prisoner. Mr. Mayhern sat in the court and listened to the damning story that the latter told. It was on the lines she had indicated to him in their interview. The prisoner reserved his defence and was committed for trial. Mr. Mayhern was at his wit's end. The case against Leonard Vole was black beyond words. Even the famous KC who was engaged for the defence held out little hope. If we can shake that Austrian woman's testimony, we might do something. But it's a bad business. Mr. Mayhern had concentrated his energies on one single point. Assuming Leonard Vole to be speaking the truth, and to have left the murdered woman's house at nine o'clock, who was the man whom Janet heard talking to Miss French at half-past nine? The only ray of light was in the shape of a scapegrace nephew who had, in bygone days, cajoled and threatened his aunt out of various sums of money. Janet Mackenzie, the solicitor learned, had always been attached to this young man and had never ceased urging his claims upon her mistress. It certainly seemed possible that it was this nephew who had been with Miss French after Leonard Vole left, especially as he was not to be found in any of his old haunts. In all other directions, the lawyer's researches had been negative in their result. No one had seen Leonard Vole entering his own house or leaving that of Miss French. No one had seen any other man enter or leave the house in Cricklewood. All inquiries drew blank. It was the eve of the trial when Mr. Mayhern received the letter which was to lead his thoughts in an entirely new direction. It came by the six o'clock post, an illiterate scrawl written on common paper and enclosed in a dirty envelope with the stamp stuck on crooked. Mr. Mayhern read it through once or twice before he grasped its meaning. Dear Mr. You're the lawyer chap what acts for that young fella. If you want that painted foreign as he showed up for what she is, and her pack of lies, you count the sixteen shore rent stepney tonight. It'll cost you two hundred quid. Ask for Mrs. Mogson. The solicitor read and reread this strange, badly spelt epistle. It might, of course, be a hoax, but when he thought it over, he became increasingly convinced that it was genuine and also convinced that it was the one hope for the prisoner. The evidence of Romain Helga damned him completely, and the line the defence meant to pursue, the line that the evidence of a woman who had admittedly lived an immoral life was not to be trusted, was at best a weak one. Mr. Mayhern's mind was made up. It was his duty to save his client at all costs. He must go to Shaw's rents. He had some difficulty in finding the place, a ramshackle building in an evil-smelling slum. But at last he did so, and on inquiry for Mrs. Mogson, was sent up to a room on the third floor. On this door he knocked, and getting no answer, knocked again. At this second knock he heard a shuffling sound inside, and presently the door was opened cautiously half an inch, and a bent figure peered out. Suddenly the woman, for it was a woman, gave a chuckle and opened the door wider. <laughs> so it's you, dearie. Nobody with you, is there? 
No playing tricks. Uh, that's right. You can come in, you can come in. With some reluctance, the lawyer stepped across the threshold into the small, dirty room, with its flickering gas jet. There was an untidy, unmade bed in a corner, a plain deal table and two rickety chairs. For the first time, Mr. Mahern had a full view of the tenant of this unsavoury apartment. She was a woman of middle age, bent in figure, with a mass of untidy grey hair and a scarf wound tightly round her face. She saw him looking at this and laughed again, the same curious, toneless chuckle. <laughs> Wondering why I hide my beauty, dear. <laughs> Afraid it may tempt you. Uh, you'll see. You'll see. She drew aside the scarf and the lawyer recoiled involuntarily before the almost formless blur of scarlet. She replaced the scarf again. So you're not wanting to kiss me, dearie? <laughs> I don't wonder. And yet I was a pretty girl once, not so long ago. Vitriol, dearie, vitriol, that's what did it. Oh, but I'll be even with them. She burst into a hideous torrent of profanity, which Mr. Mahern tried vainly to quell. She fell silent at last, her hands clenching and unclenching themselves nervously. Now that's enough of that. I've come here because I have reason to believe you can give me information which will clear my client, Leonard Vole. Is that the case? Her eye leered at him cunningly. What about the money, dearie? Two hundred quid, you remember? It is your duty to give evidence, and you can be called upon to do so. <laughs> that won't do, dearie. I'm an old woman. I know nothing. But you give me two hundred quid, and perhaps I can give you a hint or two, see? What kind of hint? What should you say to a letter? A letter from her? Never mind how I got hold of it. That's my business. But it'll do the trick. But I want my two hundred quid. Mr. Mahern looked at her coldly and made up his mind. I'll give you ten pounds, nothing more. And only that, if this letter is what you say it is. Ten pounds? She screamed and raved at him. Twenty. That's my last word. He rose as if to go. Then, watching her closely, he drew out a pocket book and counted out twenty one-pound notes. You see, this is all I have with me. You can take it or leave it. But he already knew that the sight of the money was too much for her. She cursed and raved impotently, but at last she gave in. Going over to the bed, she drew something out from beneath the tattered mattress. Here you are, damn you! It's a top one you want! It was a bundle of letters that she threw to him, and Mr. Mayhern untied them and scanned them in his usual cool, methodical manner. The woman watching him eagerly could gain no clue from his impassive face. He read each letter through, then returned again to the top one and read it a second time. Then he tied the whole bundle up again carefully. They were love letters, written by Romain Heilger, and the man they were written to was not Leonard Vole. The top letter was dated the day of the latter's arrest. I spoke to dearie, didn't I? It'll do for her, won't it, that letter? Mr. Mayhern put the letters in his pocket. How did you get hold of this correspondence? That's telling, but I know something more. I heard in court what that hussy said. Find out where she was at twenty past ten. The time she said she was at home. Ask at the Lion Road Cinema. They'll remember a fine upstanding girl like that. Curse her. Who is the man? There is only Christine name here. The other's voice grew thick and hoarse. Her hands clenched and unclenched. Finally, she lifted one to her face. He's the man that did this to me. Many years ago now. She took him away from me. A shit of a girl she was then. And when I went after him, and went for him too, he threw the cursed stuff at me. And she laughed, damn her! Oh, I've had it in for her for years. Followed her, I have. Spied upon her. And now I've got her. 
Oh, she'll suffer for this, won't she, eh? She'll suffer, won't she, Mr. Lawyer, eh? Eh? She'll suffer! She will probably be sentenced to a term of imprisonment for perjury. <laughs> Shut away. That's what I want. You're going, are you? Well, where's my money? Where's that good money? Without a word, Mr. Mayhern put down the notes on the table. Then, drawing a deep breath, he turned and left the squalid room. Looking back, he saw the old woman crooning over the money. He wasted no time. He found the cinema in Lion Road easily enough, and, shown a photograph of Romaine Heilger, the commissionaire recognised her at once. She had arrived at the cinema with a man some time after ten o'clock on the evening in question. He had not noticed her escort particularly, but he remembered the lady who had spoken to him about the picture that was showing. They stayed until the end, about an hour later. Mr. Mahern was satisfied. Romaine Halger's evidence was a tissue of lies from beginning to end. She had evolved it out of her passionate hatred. The lawyer wondered whether he would ever know what lay behind that hatred. What had Leonard Vole done to her? He seemed dumbfounded when the solicitor had reported her attitude to him. He had declared earnestly that such a thing was incredible. Yet it had seemed to Mr. Mayhew that after the first astonishment, his protests had lacked sincerity. He did know Mr. Mayhern was convinced of it. He knew, but had no intention of revealing the fact. The secret that lay between them remained a secret. The solicitor glanced at his watch. It was late, but time was everything. He hailed a taxi and gave an address. Sir Charles must know of this at once, he murmured to himself as he got in. The trial of Leonard Vole for the murder of Emily French aroused widespread interest. In the first place, the prisoner was young and good-looking. Then he was accused of a particularly dastardly crime. And there was the further interest of Romain Heilger, the principal witness for the prosecution. There had been pictures of her in many papers, and several fictitious stories as to her origin and history. The proceedings opened quietly enough. Various technical evidence came first. Then Janet Mackenzie was called. She told substantially the same story as before. In cross-examination, counsel for the defence succeeded in getting her to contradict herself once or twice over her account of Vole's association with Miss French, he emphasised the fact that though she had heard a man's voice in the sitting-room that night, there was nothing to show that it was Vole who was there, and he managed to drive home a feeling that jealousy and dislike of a prisoner were at the bottom of a good deal of her evidence. Then the next witness was called. Your name is Romain Heilger? Yes. You are an Austrian subject? Yes. For the last three years you have lived with the prisoner and passed yourself off as his wife. Just for a moment, Romaine Heilger's eye met those of the man in the dock. Her expression held something curious and unfathomable. Yes. The questions went on. Word by word the damning facts came out. On the night in question the prisoner had taken out a crowbar with him. He had returned at twenty minutes past ten and had confessed to killing the old lady. His cuffs had been stained with blood, and he had burned them in the kitchen stove. He had terrorised her into silence by means of threats. As the story proceeded, the feeling of a court which had to be begun with been slightly favourable to the prisoner, now set dead against him. He himself sat with downcast head and moody air, as though he knew he were doomed. Yet it might have been noticed that her own counsel sought to restrain Romaine's animosity. He would have preferred her to be a more unbiased witness. Formidable and ponderous, counsel for the defence arose. He put it to her that her story was a malicious fabrication from start to finish, and that she had not even been in her own house at the time in question, that she was in love with another man, and was deliberately seeking to send Vole to his death for a crime he did not commit. Romaine denied these allegations with superb insolence. Then came the surprising denouement, the production of a letter. It was read aloud in court, in the midst of a breathless stillness. Max, beloved, the fates have delivered him into our hands. 
he has been arrested for murder. But yes, the murder of an old lady, Leonard, who could not hurt a fly. At last I shall have my revenge. The poor chicken. I shall say that he came in that night with blood upon him, but he confessed to me. I shall hang him, Max, and when he hangs, he will know and realize that it was Romaine who sent him to his death. And then, happiness, beloved, happiness at last. There were experts present, ready to swear that the handwriting was that of Romaine Eilger, but they were not needed. Confronted with the letter, Romain broke down utterly and confessed everything. Leonard Vole had returned to the house at the time, he said, twenty past nine. She had invented the whole story to ruin him. With the collapse of Romain Heilger, the case for the Crown collapsed also. Sir Charles called his next witness. The prisoner himself went into the box and told his story in a manly, straightforward manner, unshaken by cross-examination. The prosecution endeavoured to rally, but without great success. The judge's summing up was not wholly favourable to the prisoner, but a reaction had set in and the jury needed little time to consider their verdict. We find the prisoner not guilty. Leonard Vole was free. Little Mr Mayhew hurried from his seat. He must congratulate his client. He found himself polishing his pince-nez vigorously, and checked himself. His wife had told him only the night before that he was getting a habit of it. Curious things, habits. People themselves never knew they had them. An interesting case. A very interesting case. That woman now, Romaine Heilger. <laughs> the case was dominated for him still by the exotic figure of Romaine Heilger. She had seemed a pale, quiet woman in the house at Paddington, but in court she had flamed out against the sober background. She had flaunted herself like a tropical flower. If he closed his eyes he could see her now, tall and vehement, her exquisite body bent forward a little, her right hand clenching and unclenching itself unconsciously all the time. Yes, curious things, habits. That gesture of hers of the hand was her habit. Yet he had seen someone else do it quite lately. Who was it now? Quite lately... He drew in his breath with a gasp as it came back to him. The woman in Shaw's rents! He stood still, his head whirling. It's impossible, impossible! Yet Romain Heilger is an actress. The KC came up behind him and clapped him on the shoulder. Congratulated our man yet? He had a narrow shave, you know. Narrow shave. Very. Now come along and see him. But the little lawyer shook off the other's hand. He wanted one thing only, to see Romaine Heilger face to face. He did not see her again until some time later, and the place of their meeting is not relevant. So, you guessed, she said when he told her all that was in his mind. The face, oh, that was easy enough, and the light of the gas jet was too bad for you to see the make-up. But why? Why? Why did I play a lone hand? Such an elaborate comedy. My friend, I had to save him. The evidence of a woman devoted to him would not have been enough. You hinted as much yourself. But I know something of the psychology of crowds. Let my evidence be wrung from me as an admission, damning me in the eyes of a law and a reaction in favour of the prisoner would immediately set in. And the bundle of letters? One alone, the vital one, might have seemed like a, what do you call it, a put-up job. Then the man called Max never existed, my friend. I still think that we could have got him off by, by normal procedure. I dared not risk it. You see, you thought he was innocent. And you knew it, yes, I see. My dear Mr. Mahan, you do not see it all. I knew he was guilty. 